Thank you, Awake to Israel, for this great invitation. It's always great to speak on a prophetic theme, and the Book of Amos contains that. So thank you, Richard and Hannah, and all the organization behind it. Uh, I miss meeting you uh, in the physical, but I'm glad that we can do this online. It's a great difficulty to preach on Amos. I've tried to record this now twice before and twice I went significantly over time so the first time by uh, almost an hour so forgive me if I don't deal with everything that I should be dealing with. Having said that let's delve in. I want to look at who Amos was and Amos comes from the word Amas meaning burden and maybe his real name, maybe not, and it means that he carries the burden of the Lord for the northern kingdom. You'll remember that the kingdom split in two after David and Solomon, and so the northern kingdom is the kingdom of Israel, and that's primarily who he writes to. Now he is not from the north, he is not from Samaria, he's from Tekoa, which is about 20 kilometers south of Jerusalem. And by occupation, he, uh, in chapter 1, he says that he is a sheep breeder, uh, no kadim is the Hebrew word. It's only used one more time in Scripture, in 2 Kings 3, verse 4, where it talks about Mesha, the king of Moab, who was a sheep breeder, uh, and who used to pay the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. So this is not an insignificant term. He's not just a general shepherd as some translations have it. In chapter 7 verse 14 it then adds that he also has herd. He's a herdsman. He has cattle. So he's not only a sheep breeder, in other words has a large flock of sheep, but he also has cattle and he's a keeper of sycamore trees. So it's probably best seen, uh, best to see him as somebody who is a businessman rather than as a, a poor little shepherd from the south. Now he comes at a time of Uzziah, uh, who reigned from 792 to 740 before the common era, and Jeroboam II, when there was great wealth in Israel, and in both northern and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom actually paid tribute, it is believed, to the northern kingdom. And he says that these words came to him two years before the earthquake. Now the earthquake is referred to in Zechariah 14, verses 4 to 5. And in Josephus, now Josephus is quite late in comparison, uh, Amos is an, an 8th century prophet, Josephus is a 1st century of the common era, and so there's quite a bit of a delay in that, but we don't quite have a year. Now, most people place it between 760 to 745, I've given you 755 just as a general background. Now, these prophecies happen and he gives them some 40 years before the captivity of Israel into Assyria. So great wealth because they had tra captured the trade routes of uh, the nation surrounding them. So a lot of tributary came in. But the nation itself was in dire straits. And when we read Second Kings chapter 17, we see that background, verses 7 to 23. And it is a shocking time for the kingdom. Uh, great wealth. Uh, great things are happening and a great spiritual decline. Uh, the kingdom, the northern kingdom in particular was never faithful to the Lord but now had gone steps too far and again 2nd Kings 17 would be the chapter that you want to read in terms of its background. And because that goes beyond our purposes for today I don't want to do that but I want to look at a few major themes within the book and some of the major themes I've given you here as an outline the uh, social evils, the paganized worship, the lack of repentance though that word is not in the text nowhere does Amos say people repent because the people had gone beyond the pale, they had gone beyond what was allowable there was a point of no return they had reached it and therefore judgment was coming. So if you have a Bible, he, the words of, uh, sorry, we're in chapter 4 verse 1. Here are the words, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor and crush the needy, 
who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. This is a, a summary statement of the social evil, oppress the poor, crush the needy. And so they were in it for themselves and what they could get out of it. In chapter 5 we see paganized worship and we see that in verses 25 and 26. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years or house of Israel? You also carried along Sikut your king and Kiyun your images, the star of your gods which you made for yourself. And then God pronounces that judgment against them. And so he makes it very clear that he will not allow this to be part of his worship. But they carried along the false gods. Now during the wandering years we don't read about it, but they did present uh, offerings. But it, here God says, you've now gone beyond what is acceptable. It is not just that they set up the two golden calves anymore. The two golden calves were bad enough. But now there is a point where he says, okay, now you've gone too far. And therefore, this is the key verse, I believe, in the Bible to understand it. It's in chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And so he's now saying judgment essentially is coming. Now, in this verse... What is he really saying? Prepare to meet your God. Well, on the one hand, it's a challenge. No doubt about that. Secondly, it's an invitation. If you had something to say, come and speak to me. But I think it best seen as a summons, as a legal judgment. Hey, uh, here's a court case and I'm against you, O Israel. I am your judge. Therefore, come and meet me. Come and prepare to meet me. And so that is the key verse that we have. And so it is a scary thing. And so, as I indicated, there's no call for re repentance to the nations, though the word repentance in some translation is used uh, for God, that God changed his mind, and that would be a better way to put it. Now there is a little message of hope, not a great message, which is found at the end of the book in chapter 9 verses 11 to 15 where it talks about the restoration of the kingdom of David. Now Amos as a whole has a, a fairly simple outline. There are eight charges against the various nations, including Judah and Israel, chapters 1 and 2. Then there are three sermons which are specifically against the northern kingdom chapters 3 to 6. Then there are five visions of judgment, chapters 7, 8, and the first half of chapter 9. Then that message of hope, that one message of hope that is found so in the end. As we go through this book, we'll, we'll do it a little bit of chronologically. We won't deal with everything because it goes beyond us. But he has a unique phrase for three transgressions and for four. Now we're not sure whether that was a saying at the time or whether there's a unique Amosism. You'll forgive me. I know that's not a word, but and so but it's uniquely to Amos. And so he addresses the various kingdoms at this point. And initially he starts off with the nations that surround the nation of Israel. He starts off in the north with the kingdom of Damascus, uh, the kingdom of uh, Syria, and it's in chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And so he has that entry point every time, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions, in this case of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke its punishment. And that's in this case because they trashed the people of Gilead with implements of sharp iron. What happened is they had a war, they conquered some of the people, then got them to lay down, or they were bound more likely, and then with trashing instruments, with cutting instruments, they would run over them and kill them. And so it's a pretty horrific scene. He then moves to Philistia, or Gaza, in verses 6 to 8. And again, he has that opening line for three transgressions and for four. God will not revoke its punishment, uh, because they 
deported an entire population to deliver it to Edom. Now, this particular sin seems to indicate that they were selling people into slavery. And so while slavery was common, you did not sell your slaves on, on a national basis. You kept them within your realm. But here, the people are not doing that. And so he mentions a number of the cities, and he says, judgment is coming against you. He then moves on in verses 9 to 10 to Tyre. Again, the standard opening. Because they delivered up the entire population to Edom. So that's, they're involved with that slave trade. But secondly, they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. It's the brotherhood covenant that David and Solomon had made with King Hiram. Uh, in preparation for the temple and when the temple was built. And he says, because they've forgotten it, they'll be punished. And again, it's rather significant because they too delivered the people up. We then come to the next one, which is Edom. And Edom is a little bit closer because Edom is now blood related. It's cousins. Edom, Moab and Ammon are related by blood. So we're now coming closer. Because he pursued his brother, that's Israel, or Jacob, with the sword when he stifled his compassion. His anger, is also tore, his anger also tore continually. He maintained his fury forever. And so God says, I will punish them because they continually had a hatred against the Jewish people. The continual or perpetual hatred is also seen in the book of Obadiah where it will be judged. We then come to Ammon in verses 13 to 15 and it's the same standard opening. And it says, because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge its borders. Now in war, rape happens. It happened then, it happens today. But here the women are not raped, but they are killed. All pregnant women were killed, which meant that the next generation was no longer ethnically of that line. The ethnicity in the Bible is always defined by the father, not the mother. And so here they would wipe out an entire population. And he says, because you've done this, you'll be punished. But you only did it to enlarge your borders. Therefore you will be punished. We then come to the final one, which is in Moab, and that's in chapter 2. And it's an interesting one because it says, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. Now Moab and Edom are closely related, but to burn bones is to show utter contempt. And he says, because you showed utter contempt, I will punish you. And so these are the punishments that are meted of the places surrounding Israel and Judah. And up to now, the people of Israel would have said, Amen, Amen, this is great stuff. Preach it, brother. But now he continues and he goes on to Judah in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And this is a little bit closer to home and therefore uncomfortable. For three transgressions, of Judah and for four I will not revoke its punishment because they rejected the Torah the law of the Lord they have not kept the statutes their lies also have led them astray those after which their fathers walked and so God will then send punishment first of all they rejected the, the law of the Lord this is what is God decreed and they said, we will follow it in our own ways, in our own customs, in our own methods. And God said, no, you reject, I reject. They've not kept the statute, so even individual commandments were ignored. And so lies also, their lies also have led them astray. In other words, they were telling now that the prophets were wrong, and they needed new prophets that would tell them lies according to their own desires. We then come to the final one, and that's concerning Israel, the transgressions of Israel. And again, he has that formula for three transgressions over four. 
And when we think about that little statement, what we see is that he's saying this. The straw that broke the camel's back is this sin. For three transgressions, and the fourth one broke the camel back. Another way to look at it is to say uh, the cup was full with three transgressions, but with four it overflowed, and the cup of iniquity therefore had to be punished. And the cup of iniquity is surrounding all the nations around them, but particularly for Israel. The northern kingdom is the target of uh, the prophet Amos, and he says, prepare to meet your God, it's all about you and the sermons that are coming are about you and so God will not uh, be kind to you for three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not revoke its punishment because they sell the righteous for money greed the needy for a pair of sandals even for the lowest things that don't have any value we make money these pants after the very dust of the earth on whose hand of the helpless in other words they rejected the poor who needed their help they turn away from the humble the words those who requested help and a father and his sorry and a man and his father resorted to the same girl in order to profane my holy name on garments taken as pledges they stretch out beside every altar this is shrine prostitution it could not get worse. They had the two golden calves. That was bad. But now God is saying, you've gone even beyond that. You're worshipping foreign gods and shrine prostitution. The, the height of idolatry and idolatrous pagan worship. So this is bad. We then come to the three sermons that he has. And the three sermons are uh, quite interesting, but beyond our time to be able to deal with this. But listen to these opening words in chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. They all start off in the same way. Hear this word. Hear this word. Hear this word. So here's the repetitive frame. These are the three sermons. Now in chapter 1, he's dealing with the calamity because of the sins that they had committed. And so in chapter 1, he describes the horrible events that are coming because of what they have done. In chapter 4 he again starts off with listen or in the old English hear ye, hear ye. Uh, again three reasons are given oppressing the poor, persisting in their idolatry and failure to repent. Now, again, the word repentance isn't in there, but they did not respond to the call of the prophets. Therefore, God will send a plague among you. Therefore, prepare to meet your God. Now, chapter 5 is a little bit different because in chapter 5, again, he has that start and it, he's giving a, a keynote in Hebrew, a, a funeral song, a dirge, a, a little song about the nation. And he's saying, you have died, and this is my funeral song for you. But now he doesn't just say, listen, pay attention, wake up. He now starts off with, woe. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. And that's in chapter 5, in verse 18. Alas, for you who are longing for the day of the Lord. And this is misrepresenting what the day of the Lord is. So now false teaching had come in. They had hoped that the day of the Lord would be that glorious kingdom day. Now it's true that there is an element of that. But the day of the Lord is the day of tribulation. But they believed that the day of tribulation would not come for them because they were living in a wealthy time, in an opulent time when everything went their way. And so there was no need for them to repent because God was blessing them. Or so they thought. Yes, they had captured the trade roads, therefore they could do whatever they wanted. But God is holding them to account because they oppressed the poor, they persisted in idolatry, and they failed to repent. Therefore, he says, you are a dead nation. In chapter 6, he says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. 
Now this is interesting because while it's written to the northern kingdom, he now says Zion is included, and that's Jerusalem. And indeed both the southern and the northern kingdom would fall into the same trap. And the southern kingdom would be punished later, but both of them were committing evils. Now the southern kingdom had some good kings and therefore retained their status a little bit longer. But here it says, we're at ease, we're okay. And the northern kingdom agreed to this. In chapter 6 then, he really hones in in verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord, the God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob. And that's a summary statement of what God is bringing to them. He's saying, I've charged you, I've sent prophets to you, you did not listen, you did not repent, but now I loathe you. And therefore, like the Amorites that went before you, I will throw you out of my land. The land will vomit you out, out of words from Deuteronomy. And that's what we see at this point coming. And so God will smash the houses and he will remove them. Now, all of these verses, uh, sorry, all of these uh, chapters, they have a key verse, and what we see is that the three uh, key verses are in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It's the word of the Lord that he has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he had brought up, so it includes north and south. Only you have I chosen, yet why do you continue in your iniquities? In chapter 4, verse 12, we already mentioned that. Uh, he says, prepare to meet your God. And this is in a legal sense, in a judgment sense, that he would meet them. In verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord your God will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The nation chose not to do this and chose not to show justice, nor love good, uh, do righteously, do justice. Uh, it didn't do that. It loved to do evil, and particularly in the worship that comes out, but also in its behavior. And then in verse 24, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like the ever-flowing stream. Uh, God, in a sense, is the everlasting one who brings justice and righteousness. And what we see is that they chose to go directly opposite of what God had required from them. Now, before I go too far into the next segment, I just want to deal with one verse, Amos chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsels to, the, to his servants, the prophet. A lion has roared, who will not fear, the Lord has spoken, who can, be prophet, who can but prophesy? Now, in the context of the entire book, Amos is speaking of the coming judgment upon Israel. And God had revealed this secret to his prophets. In other words, that the day of the Lord was a day of judgment that was coming. It had been prophesied before and would continue to be told. And so there is time to repent, return to your God. Now the context is what it's all about. Now many people today quote this verse and say, oh look at these new prophets that we have, these new apostles. And that's not true because if we, if we take it at a literal out of context, we would say, well there's a problem here. In Ephesians 3, Paul clearly describes how God deliberately hit the nature of the church, being a, the one new man, the one new body, made up out of Jew and Gentile together, one and Messiah. This is something that wasn't revealed to the Old Testament prophets. There are a number of mysteries that are foretold by, sorry, that are told by Paul in the New Testament. So it's not that God does nothing without revealing it first. It just means that within the context of this book, God has revealed his secret and Amos is saying, I've been told this, 
what can I do but prophesy? And we should be careful with that verse. We then come to chapter 7 and we see visions of judgment in chapter 7 and 8 and 9. And there are three visions initially. The vision of the locust. And God is saying, I'm going to send a plague of locusts upon you in chapter 7. And when they come, uh, there is nothing left. And Amos intercedes for the people and says, Lord, this cannot be because Jacob cannot survive. How can Jacob stand? It is too small. And so here the Lord repented, changed his mind. Nacham is the word. He changed his uh, mind about this. It shall not be, says the Lord. Then a vision of fire in verses 4 to 6. And again, God is saying, it shall not be because you've interceded for the nation. And it's a lesson for us to intercede for our nation. God then changes tact and rather than declare, this is what I'll do, he says, let me tell you why I'm doing this. And that's the vision of the plumb line. The plumb line would have been held against the wall. Is it straight or is it crooked? And that's what he's saying, Amos, what do you see? And then he says, I put a plumb line in the midst of my people and I will spare them no longer because of their pagan worship. And so he will rise up against the house of Jeroboam, it's the Lord himself, and it is with the sword. So that is by conquest. We then see a small historical interlude, and the interlude is found in chapter 7, verses 10 to 17, which is the opposition of the local priest, Amasia, who then goes to the king, Jeroboam, Jeroboam the second, and says, Hey, Amos has conspired against you, and he is uh, hoping that you will be killed. He's, he's causing a rebellion. And then Amos is told, you can't prophesy here anymore. True prophets are told not to prophesy. People who have a true prophetic vision are often told, don't speak, because all you talk about is repentance and judgment. And those things are coming, and it distinguishes the so-called modern prophets, because many of them only say, God will bless you, God will bless you, don't worry about your sins, God will bless you, just send me your money. It is such a sharp contrast, I, I, I just had to point that out. He then gives a warning to Amasia, and he says, your wife will become a harlot in the city and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. And Israel, the northern kingdom, will go into exile. And so this is the judgment then specifically on his house, but the judgment of the Lord still stands. And that's the point that he makes in that last verse. We then come to the vision of the basket of summer fruit in chapter 8 verses 1 to 14. And what we have here is a picture of that the fruit is too ripe. It's overly ripe. The summer fruit at the end of the harvest, it's uh, fully ripe. It should have been edible. It should have been good. And so he's asked by the Lord, what do you see? And he says, this is what I saw. And then the Lord says, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. Just as the harvest was collected from the land, so my people will be harvested from the land. And that's what we then read in these verses. And there's a pretty graphic description of that in the next couple of chapters. Sorry, in the next couple of verses. We then come to the vinyl vision, and that's in chapter 9, verses 1 to 10. And here's one of those unusual ones where we see that the Lord himself appears, and that's obviously the Messiah. It's a pre-incarnate form. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Smite the capital so that the thresholds will shake. Now there's some dispute over which temple this is. Is this in uh, the, the temple in heaven? Is this on the temple on earth? Is this in Samaria? Is this in Jerusalem? I take it to mean it's a symbolic vision that he sees, and it's referring to the northern kingdom primarily. Smite the capitals that the threshold may shake, and break them on the heads of all of them. And then I will slay the rest of them with the sword. And so it's the northern kingdom 
their worship, their people will be removed one way or the other. That's essentially what the Lord is saying at this point. And so he's removing all of them. In verse 7, he then says, Are you not, not like the sons of Ethiopia, the sons of Cush to me, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? Have I not brought you up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor? And he now mentions a whole lot of people that have been transposed by the Lord from one place to another. And he's saying, if you're really honest, you're no different than them. Yes, I chose you. Yes, I wanted you. But, key verse, verse 10, But all the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. So even in the very end, when Amos had proclaimed all of his messages, they were still saying, you're preaching lies. Stop preaching this. Go away. Only good things will happen. Forty years later, this was fulfilled. And so it is with pain in his heart that I can just imagine Amos stand there saying, why don't his people listen? He had interceded for the people like Moses did, uh, like Yeshua later on would do. And so there is a pain in his heart and he senses that the end has come. And so there were charges against the nations, then three sermons, particularly against the nation of Israel, then there were judgments coming, but in the end he does end up with a message of hope. And that's in chapter 9, and in verse 11 to 15. In that day I will raise up the fallen tabernacle of David, and the wall up, and wall up its breaches, I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnants of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seeds, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and the hills will be dissolved. Also I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. And they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine. And make gardens and eat their fruit. And I will also plant them on their land. And they will no longer be rooted out of their own land. Which I will give them, says the Lord God. It's interesting when I read that, that I see that he starts off the fallen tabernacle of David. Not the fallen tabernacle of Jerome the second, the first, or Omri or or Jerome the second. No, this is about David's kingdom. Uh, David uh, is referred to a number of times that his kingdom will come and endure forever. The Davidic covenant. Uh, it's the covenant in which uh, Jesus is going to be king in the millennial kingdom, but it is essentially a sudden kingdom prophecy the tabernacle of David Judah then he mentions the captivity of my people Israel and after the exile whether they came from the northern kingdom or from the, the southern kingdom they were called Jews Israel Israelites Hebrews they're all synonymous terms they're not specifically time directed though sometimes they are but all of these are interchangeable. So I think he's saying, after the exile, when you've come back, you'll all be Israel. And so the Jewish people, whether they are from the northern tribes or the southern tribes, you're one people. And they will be considered as one people. This is yet a blessing to come. The biggest blessing that he says is still to come is that they will dwell in the land and that the land will be supernaturally uh, given up its fruit, uh, as we read here, that the plowman will overtake the reaper. And so this is something that cannot happen in the natural. But when God will establish his messianic kingdom, uh, a time when all Israel will be saved, Isaiah 45, 17, Jeremiah 31, 7, uh, Romans 11, verses 26 to 27, it is at that point that they will be regathered to their land. Isaiah 11, verses 11 to chapter 12, verse 6. 
uh, Isaiah 43. But this will happen not because of who Israel is, because both Israel is taken out here and disappeared, and the southern kingdom essentially falls into the same worship. But God is doing this based on Ezekiel 36 verses 16 to 38. Now it goes beyond my time to read all of that, but let me read to you a couple of verses. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned amongst the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned amongst the nations where you went. So even as God dispersed them amongst the nations, they would still profane his holy name. It is only by grace through faith that they will be saved. And it's by grace through faith that they will be given the land. And it's by grace through faith that God will not only restore the nations, but he will also restore Israel in particular. And he will make the land fruitful and a real blessing. So let me bring this quickly to a conclusion. There were eight charges against the nations, including two against Israel. There were three sermons then specifically against Israel and five judgments, one message of hope. The charge against the nations and against Israel still stand because God has not changed his statements. God has not changed his opinions. The holiness of God is still there. Judgment is still coming, those here and woe. And if God judged Israel for what they did, he will judge us for what we did. So we need to listen and repent. Because the Holy One, blessed be He, will judge sin. But praise God, He will also fulfill His promise. So I have no doubt that He will fulfill what He has said. Is there a lesson in it for us? Many lessons. But if we look at the spiritual condition, we need to make sure that our spiritual condition is just doing prayers and going to Sunday services. But that we also look after the poor, the orphan, the widows, a message that we find in the book of James. And that we show our faith by what we do. Uh, by meeting the physical and spiritual needs of the people. It's a message that still echoes today and people like Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, even David Ben-Gurion used these uh, chapters from the book of Amos to say let peace come and let justice reign. We can achieve this. Well I don't think we can but I think by grace through faith God will establish his coming kingdom and he will forgive our sins and at that point they will dwell in the land. Well my time is up uh, until uh, soon I hope and uh, many blessings and thank you again for allowing me to speak. Uh, I hope this was somewhat valuable to you. I, I would suggest to read it a few times and uh, God willing, we'll meet soon and discuss it in full length. Many thanks again. Blessings.